you're going to want to have your hands on this afternoon. So make sure you get that. Um, you also notice in your, uh, in your stack of stuff there, there's a thing about uh, Movie Under the Stars. That's coming up this Friday night at 8.15. And I hope that you'll use this little piece of paper to give to somebody to invite them to be here. We're trying to make it as easy as we can. And the reason we're doing this is just a real practical way to show God's love, to kind of have a community event that's free with free popcorn and candy and drinks and all that good stuff. Uh, in fact, we've got another little surprise we've ordered that we'll have for everybody. So make sure you come and bring somebody with you to that. August 6th is our first ever blood drive. We would love for you to be a part of showing God's love to our community in that way. Uh, there's a link to sign up. You don't have to sign up, but it'll help them to plan and, and make sure they have enough uh, you know, equipment and personnel here. And this thing, why it keeps growing, I think... Everybody gets a t-shirt, everybody gets a gift card, I think there's going to be a prize drawing, I think they're going to have burgers, so it'll probably be a full-blown carnival by the time it actually gets here, so I hope you'll be a part of that as well. You can also read about serving with us at Loaves and Fishes on August 12th, another great way to love on our community and meet a need. Well, we're going to get started with praise and worship, so go ahead and stand up and we will get it rolling. Good morning. We're so excited to worship with y'all today. We're going to start things off with a brand new song. So let's put our hands together and have some fun as we worship today. We are here to bless your name.
just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus.
tried so hard to see it. It took me so long to believe it. You'd choose someone like me to carry your victory. Perfection could never earn it. You give what we don't deserve, and will you take them broken things like me and raise them to victory? Every battle you won, I am who you say I am. You crown me with confidence, I am seated in the heavenly place, undefeated with the one who has conquered. says that we've been made more than conquerors through Jesus who loved us. He has conquered death, hell, and the grave, and there's nothing in your life that he can't conquer today. When I lift my voice and shout, every wall comes crashing. has given me when I open up my mouth miracles start breaking out I have the authority Jesus has
worship you, that we lift up the name of Jesus, the name that's above every name, because it's in you alone that we find salvation. I pray that today will be a day of salvation for the one who doesn't know you today. Bless your word as it goes forth. Help Todd bring it forth in the power of your spirit. All right, so we are continuing the teaching series. We're going through the last six of the Ten Commandments. Those are the commandments that are all about our relationships with other people. And we've called the series Unreal because we said that the only way you can enjoy the authentic relationships God intends for you to have is if you take steps towards becoming the real you that God created you to be. So we're figuring out how to do that. Today we're at this Eighth Commandment, Exodus 20, verse 15, which simply says, you shall not steal. Now that takes me all the way back to when I was a kid in Pendergrass by right, and I got a Tootsie Roll and I put it in my pocket and I didn't tell my mom and I took it home and I felt bad about it, but I ate it anyway. And maybe you have a story like that. Probably you have a story like that, right? Uh, maybe your parents caught you. Maybe they took you back, made you apologize, make restitution, whatever it might be. In case you're sitting there right now thinking, I never stole anything and you're polishing your halo, let me help you out, all right? Give you a few other examples. If you ever took extra Splenda packets or napkins from Chick-fil-A, that's stealing, all right? If you use somebody else's Netflix login, that's stealing. If you took a church pen home with you and used it to write about anything except the sermon, that's stealing, right? That's a, why banks chain those things. No, I'm just kidding about the pens, all right? I want to make sure you know. One time I made a joke about the church pens, and like 27 people felt bad and put their pens back in the offering that day. So that's what they're for, is for you to take and use and enjoy, okay? This week I did a little exercise where I tried to restate each of the commandments in a positive way without using the word not. And it was kind of enlightening what, it, what I landed at because, like, do not use God's name in vain becomes represent God's name well. And do not murder becomes pursue reconciliation. And do not commit adultery becomes honor marriage. And it occurred to me, as we've been kind of bouncing back and forth between the commandments and the Sermon on the Mount, that that's essentially what Jesus kept saying about each of these commandments as he addressed them was stating them in a positive way. Here's what you're to do rather than just what not to do. So I wonder, how do we restate this eighth commandment about you shall not steal? I don't think it's just be generous. I mean, that's the opposite of stealing in a way. But I, I, I think about what Jesus kept doing. He kept talking about the fact that the problem's not out there somewhere in other people. He kept wanting us to look at our own hearts. So as I think about what's at the root of stealing, it occurs to me that when we steal, we're not trusting God to provide. We're taking something because we think this is the only way or the fastest way or the most sure way for me to get what I want or what I need. So really at the essence, 
I think it boils down to a worry and a control issue. So that's what we're going to be focusing on today. When we talk about worry, I realize there's a wide spectrum and we've got people at different extremes. Some of you are at one end of the spectrum where you don't worry at all. It's like we have to check your blood pressure every now and then to make sure you're even still alive because you just don't worry. So today you can just sit there and chill out, all right? In fact, that's what you're going to do anyway, right? I don't have to tell you that. Somebody will wake you up at the end of the sermon and tell you it's time to go home. And, and I'm not a person that naturally worries. I do live with one, okay? Uh, one time my wife said to me, everything's going so well, I'm worried what's going to happen to mess it up, right? So there's a whole other extreme. And then the rest of us are somewhere in the middle. And given all that's gone on in our country in the last few years, it's not a surprise that we would worry about a, a few things every now and then. What I want you to see is worry can impact our decision making. Just like with, with stealing, worry causes me to Take control because I'm not sure I can trust God to get the job done. For example, that's why some people will uh, marry somebody whose life doesn't align with God's word. They start thinking, well, this might be my last chance. This might be my only shot. And worry causes them to make a decision that will have consequences for the rest of their lives. What's interesting as you think about worry is nobody wants to do it. Nobody is saying, God, I give you everything except my worry. I want to hold on to that. I really enjoy that, right? Everybody wants to be free of anxiety. If there was a big button we could push to be rid of our worries, we're all pushing that button. Fortunately, Jesus says there is a way to live where you can be free of worry. We're going to see this morning, he's going to unpack an incredible principle that if you apply this to your life, it will change your life and it will set you free of worry. Now, before we dive into that, I want to say up front that I'm going to try not to oversimplify things because I recognize that for some people, there are some other factors that sometimes come into play into why they have anxiety. Some people have some physiological things that are leading to that. Some people uh, have, you know, trauma in their past or something. So I don't want to try to put all anxiety into one bucket. But I do want to deal with what's at the root of most of our worry and how we can prevent it from being an issue. And if you got your Bible, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 6. That's where we're going to be or your Bible app. If you don't have your Bible with you today, don't worry, okay? We got the message, we got the points on the screen, got it in the program there for you, all right? But Jesus is going to show us something that if we really get this, we really won't worry so much. Here's what he says, verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Now, as I read this, I'm almost like, how insensitive is this? I mean, look at the birds. Like, I don't have time to look at the birds. My kid's failing 11th grade. My truck just died. You know, my spouse just left. I, I don't feel well, and, and I think it, it might be COVID. I don't know. It, it, it's just, you know, like, it seems so irresponsible to just say, look at the birds. Is, is he just, you know, like, just get a surfboard and get some, you know, edible pot or something and just hang out, dudes. You know, let's just don't worry and ride our surfboard and have a latte, and it's going to be all right. We're going to ride the EAC, you know, like crush on Finding Nemo, it'll be totally gnarly. I think that's kind of Jeff Spicoli there at the end. I don't know. But, you know, that's kind of how it seems. And when I read it, I also sort of think, well, that's easy for you to say because you're Jesus. You know, you can just do this Jedi thing and turn five loaves and two fishes into a meal that feeds 5,000. Of course, you don't see a reason to worry. You don't have to deal with marriage pressures and work deadlines and playing Alabama on the road every two years, right? 
I don't have time to sit on the mountainside with binoculars and just look at the birds, you know? And, and it also, as I read it, I, I kind of think, you're saying this 2,000 years ago in a very different world and a much simpler time. We got real issues in 2022. But then I remember Jesus is living at a time when they are under Roman occupation. There is no promise of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In fact, it's just the opposite. They're under the reign of maniacal kings and crooked tax collectors. They had every reason to fear for their safety, much like parts of the Mideast today. And so they had reason to worry. Their average life expectancy then was in the 40s. They're living paycheck to paycheck. So as Jesus begins this talk, he kind of hits their stress points. He starts to talk about food and clothes and saving for the future. And I expect if he said it today, he'd probably say, don't worry about whether you're going to marry or whether you're going to have kids or if your kids are going to get into college or if you're going to have enough for retirement. He would hit the things that we stress about. Jesus is not discounting the importance of any of the stuff on your mind. He's saying, look at the birds. They don't even try. They're not going around holding their kids' hands all the time, making sure they wear a helmet and they're safe. What do birds do? They just build the nest as high as they can and push their kids out. Good luck. I mean, that's what kind of parenting is that? They don't make plans. They don't have a budget. They don't use Google Calendar. They don't do any of the responsible things that you do. You're doing so much more than the birds. He's not saying just be irresponsible and it'll all work out. That's fatalism. He's not talking about just trusting in faith. And he's not talking about not caring or, or not trying. This isn't the Hakuna Matata philosophy from the Lion King, okay? It's not Bobby McFerrin, just worry, uh, don't, what is it? Don't worry, be happy, right? It's not that. He's inviting us to trust in our Heavenly Father. He says, be responsible, you know, work hard, fill out the application, do all the right things there are to do, then... At the end of the day, after you've done everything you can today, don't worry because you remember God loves me more than the birds. Now, he started this with therefore, right? When I was a kid, my pastor used to always say in the Bible, whenever you see the word therefore, you need to go back and see what it's there for, right? That's I see what he did there. So what's the context here? Well, as he begins this talk about worry, Guess what subject he used to set it up? I'll give you one guess. Money, right? Look at what he said just prior to this. Verse 24. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one, love the other, or you'll be devoted to, you might underline that, devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. That's interesting. You would think if he's going to say God and the opposite of God, you'd say God and the devil or God and sin or evil. But he says money. Why would he say money? Well, it's interesting. Today, in 2022, over 70% of Americans say their number one worry is money. We worry about how to make it go further, how to get more of it, how to save it, how to protect it. And we buy into the illusion that what we need to keep from worrying about money is a little bit more money, right? So here's the first thing I want you to see in the notes. If I don't want worry to steal my peace, I've got to pinpoint my priorities by my worries. Pinpoint my priorities by my worries. Well, preacher boy, what do you mean by that? Well, here's what I mean. Your worries reveal your priorities. Your worries reveal what's most important to you. You show me what you worry about, and I'll show you what you really value. That's why you worry about it, because it matters to you. You're devoted to it, was the way Jesus said it. If you worry about your kids, it's because your kids are valuable to you, and that's a good thing. 
you worry about your marriage, it's because your marriage is important to you. If you worry about your job or your health, it's because those things matter. If something's not important to you, if you're not devoted to it, you don't worry about it. It doesn't even occur to you that would be a thing to do. I mean, for example, just to be completely transparent, as the kids go back to school, if your kid starts failing a class this fall and you email me about it, I'm going to feel compassion, I'm going to pray for you, but I'm not going to lose any sleep over it, all right? In fact, while I'm confessing stuff, I'll just tell you this, I don't worry about your retirement. Man, I hope it works out for you, I hope you retire early and have millions of dollars and go to the Bahamas, right? But I'm not committed to your future financial security. I've never been dedicated or devoted to that. Jesus says the things you worry about the most are what you value the most, right? That's what you're most devoted to, one or the other, he says. So if you're devoted to money, if you think money is the full ingredient, if you think money's the indispensable ingredient to having a good life, then you're going to worry about money stuff. Maybe you're sitting there thinking, well, I love them both, right? I love God, and I love money and having money. We'll switch, Robert, all right, since it's coming and going so much. Let's go ahead and switch to this one, since this pack is slowly dying on us. And I'll kill this one. All right? So, where are we at? So he's talking about, yeah, he's talking about your, your, your money and your stuff. So maybe you're sitting there thinking, I love both, right? I love God and I love my stuff. Jesus is okay, but there's a tension between those two. You've got to make a choice. Which one do you love more? And if you're not sure which is really the high pri- higher priority for you, all you've got to do is look at what do I worry about the most? And that will pinpoint your actual priorities. You worry about what you're most devoted to. So, let me ask you a question. If our worries reveal our top priority, what would happen if you switch your top priority? What would happen to your worry? Well, that's an interesting idea and an important thought. Look at what Jesus says next in verse 27. He says, can any one of you, By worrying, add a single hour to your life. You might underline that single hour. Can you even do that? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? you of little faith. He says, has all your worrying ever even added a single hour to your life? The point he's, he's making, obviously, is worry doesn't change anything. It's like when you go bowling. I love watching other people bowl, all right? And I'm not talking about like professionals that are bowling 250 plus. I mean normal people like most of us. Because what do most of us do? We throw that ball and then We do everything we can after we let go to try to steer it, don't we? We start leaning and kicking and hopping and kind of doing this airplane thing, right? And it doesn't matter how much you wave your arms after you let go of that ball. It doesn't move it one inch. Just like worry doesn't have any effect on reality. It doesn't matter. It's a waste of time. If you had little kids, then... Probably you had a few shows and a few movies that you watched and heard over and over and over again, right? When our kids were little, we had a DVD player in the van, and Monsters, Inc. and A Bug's Life were on constant loop for about seven years, I think. They were on behind me, so I don't know what they look like, but I know every line of dialogue, start to finish, I could recite it to you. 
And there's one scene where this fly, you know, flies only are alive for like 24 hours. This fly is watching their little terrible carnival show, and he's just over it. And he says, I only got 24 hours to live, and I ain't going to waste them here, you know. And that's what I think about when I think about wasting time, because your time is your life. When you run out of time, you have run out of life, okay? So it's not just that worry is a waste of time. It's worse than that because it's actually destructive. See, worry doesn't change anything about the future, which is what you're worried about. The only thing it does is mess up today. Worry makes today worse. It's worse than a waste of time. So Jesus draws this relationship between the size of your worry and the size of your faith. Oh, you of little faith, he says. The reason your worries are so big is because your faith is so small. So we get caught up in this thing where I know God can. I believe God can. I have faith that God can. I just don't know if he will. I know God can help me meet the right person or get into that school or get that job, but I don't know if he will. And Jesus says, okay, but that's not faith. Faith and control are mutually exclusive. You can't have both, okay? You're acting like a little faither when you go down that train of thought. And he continues, verse 31. He says, so do not worry. Saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Now, he's not saying that food and clothes and whatever you worry about aren't important. In fact, he's saying the opposite. His point is, these things are important, and there's uncertainty related to all of those things. Those are not always going to work out the way that you want. But there is a way to face that uncertainty without worrying. When he says, do not worry, what is directly implied is, I've got you covered. Here's what I mean. After the service today, if we're talking and I say, hey, I'm going to go grab some lunch at Mi Hacienda. Come on, let's go. There we go. I already got one in. Right, hop in. You can ride with me. And here we go. And as we're on the way, you say, oh, man. I didn't think about it. I forgot my wallet. I say, don't worry about it. And we go to Mi Hacienda, and I order a large cheese dip, and you order extra guacamole, and we have shrimp nachos and quesadillas, and we chow down, okay? And at the end of the meal, the server comes by and says, will that be one check or two? And I say, that'll be two checks, please. You're like, what? I, I told you I forgot my wallet, and you said don't worry about it. And I say, oh, well, you thought that meant I was going to pay for you? I just didn't want you to worry. I was just trying to encourage you. You'd be like, you are a terrible friend and a little bit crazy, right? Because that's what that means. When I say don't worry, I'm saying I got you covered. And he says, you've got a heavenly father. He knows. And he's got you covered. He's not saying the things that, that you worry about aren't important. He's saying your father knows. He knows you want your kids to maximize their potential. He knows the pressures you have at work. He knows the insurance bill is due next month. So many times we act like God doesn't know that the mortgage is due and the kids are coughing and the car just started making a weird noise. He says he knows and he cares. Don't miss that. The things that stress you out, God cares about. Let that settle into your heart. He cares about what you care about. When he talks about the pagans there, pagans aren't people who are immoral or, or evil or something like that. Pagans were simply people who worshipped and believed in gods who did not care about them. So they are on their own in this life. So they are running after the things they're devoted to. They're working hard because for them, that's a matter of survival. They're devoting to, devoted to money and stuff and getting all they can because it's all up to them and their own capabilities. But he says, you've got a heavenly father that you know and he knows you, so don't take your cues from them. He continues, verse 33. But 
Seek first. Underline that. Seek first. In fact, would you just say that with me one time? Here we go. Seek first. He says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things that the pagans run after, that you keep worrying about, all these things will be given to you as well. Seek first means prioritize. Put it at the top of the list. He says, prioritize God's agenda. This is so practical, and I have found this so helpful in my life. Stay with me, because some of you guys have read this before, and what you heard was, don't worry, just go on a mission trip. Or don't worry, just read your Bible more. And those are great things to do, but if that was your takeaway, then you missed the power and, and the point of what Jesus said. The, the Greek word there for seek first has the same root as run after. It's the same word. So he's not just saying, don't worry, and leaving it at that. He's saying, run after something different. Jesus gives us the solution to our worries here. It's not to try harder to not worry. It's not to just stop caring. It has to do with our priorities. Jesus says, what you've been seeking first is why you are where you are emotionally. It's why you worry as much as you do. See, here's the point. Since the things that you worry about reflect what you value the most, the answer is switch what you value the most. He says, seek first his kingdom. Put God's stuff at the top of the list as the top priority. As long as you prioritize your kid's future or your financial security or having a good job or a good marriage or whatever it might be, you're going to worry. He invites us to change what's most important. So here's the second thing I want you to see in the notes. If I don't want worry to steal my peace, I switch my top priority. Switch my top priority. Some of you have been trying hard to obey the do not worry part, but you missed the seek first part. It doesn't work. You've got to change your priority. Jesus doesn't tell us to fight worry by just trying to resist worry. He says, you've got to make a shift in your focus. It's not that you stop caring about all that other stuff. It's that you start caring about God's stuff more. Whenever I experience worry, inevitably, it's related to my agenda, my concerns, my issues. I mean, what I wrestle with, unfortunately, is never laying in bed at night, unable to sleep, thinking, God, I'm just so worried about those people in Mongolia who don't know you, all right? doesn't happen. That's, that's not my issue. My struggle isn't that I'm concerned that things aren't going to work out the way God wants them to be. My concern is they're not going to be the way I want them to be. Well, newsflash, things aren't always going to be the way that I want them to be. That's called reality. So that means I've got a choice. I can either have things not always be the way that I want them to be, which is a guarantee, and worry about it, or I can have things not be the way I want it to be and have peace. Those are the options. Having things be the way I want them to be, that's not an option. Peace is. So that's the choice that I can make. So Jesus says, I'm going to show you how you can face uncertainty not have control, and not worry at the same time. And he modeled it for us. He modeled exactly what he's talking about here. The night before Jesus went to the cross, listen to what Mark wrote, writes that he did. It says, going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. He says, I don't want to experience dying on the cross and being separated from you, but I trust you, and I want what you want more. Here's what this looks like for us. It's saying, God, you know our financial struggles right now. You know what getting this new job could mean for us. You know we've been dipping into savings, and I don't know how much longer we can keep this thing afloat. You know what we want, but we want what you want more. 
is saying, God, you know how badly I want to get into this school. And I've done everything that I know to do. My temptation now is to obsess over it. But I'm choosing to trust you more. It's saying instead of prioritizing what I've been worried about, I'm choosing to prioritize you. Now, we struggle with this because we think, well, I can't just give God control like that. I can't just turn over the reins. Who knows what God might do? We talk about giving up control like we ever had it, which is crazy. You don't actually struggle with having control because you can't struggle with having something you've never had. That would be like me saying, you know what? I struggle with having x-ray vision. You're like, preacher boy, you don't have x-ray vision. You're cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. You've never had x-ray vision, right? That's not a struggle. And you don't have control. You've never had control. You're never going to have control. God is the only one who's ever been in control. So you can either fight him for it and worry, or you can choose to trust him. And if you choose to trust him, Here's the surprise ending. He says, when you do that, all these things that you worry about, that the pagans run after, that you're devoted to, all these things will be given to you. That's an amazing promise. Don't miss this. He's saying God takes full responsibility for a life that is fully surrendered to Him. God takes full responsibility for your life when you fully surrender it to Him. That's an incredible deal. When we choose to make His priorities our priorities, He promises to meet our needs. Talk about having a reason to not worry. He says, when I put God's agenda first, He promises to pick up the check. He's got my back. He's going to give me what I need. So, here's what Jesus says to do. Verse 34. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So, we're to do what we can with today. So, reap, store away in barns, right? Then when your mind starts to go down that worry trail, say, whoa, time out. Have I done everything that I can today? Yes, I've been responsible. Then now I can trust God with tomorrow. I've done more than the birds, I've done more than the flowers, and I know God loves me more than either of them. So here's the third thing. If I don't want worry to steal my peace, I do what I can today, then trust. Do what I can today, then trust. Jesus says, I give you permission to not obsess over tomorrow because I'll be there. You just be responsible for today. He's not saying don't try. Work hard. Do all the right things. Fill out the application. Do what you can today. Then at the end of the day, don't worry. Not because you don't care. Not because you're irresponsible. Not because you can control the future or you know for sure what's going to happen but because you trust the only one who can do anything about it. At the end of the day, remind yourself, my heavenly Father has promised to meet my needs, so I don't need to worry. Here's your homework, all right? Here's your assignment if you choose to accept it. Would you be willing for five mornings this week to read this passage, Matthew 6, 24 through 34. Five mornings this week, just read it straight through. It'll take you about two minutes, and then pray. If you would commit to doing that five mornings this week, would you just raise your hand right now? Raise your hand, raise your hand, raise your hand. All right. Here's what I want you. I want you to do it, and I want you to understand. Worry is a choice, and peace is a choice. And what stands between the two is prayer. So don't forget, after you read this, to talk with God about whatever He's laid on your heart. In fact, in just a moment, I want to give you an opportunity to talk with Him about that right now. I want to, as I pray at a moment, I want you to just say to God, God, I'm giving you blank, whatever it is you worry about, and just turn it over to Him. Listen, 
Praying is not worrying in the direction of the ceiling, okay? Let's do the work of actually turning it over to God and surrendering it to Him. So you talk to Him as I pray. Let's pray. Father God, we just want to take what we're worried about and give it to You. You're a good Father, and we know we can trust You. And if those thoughts of worry come back tomorrow, then we'll give it to You again. And right now, I want to pray specifically for for my friends in the room who are going through especially dark times right now, where they're in a season that it's hard to see what you're doing. It's hard to understand why you would allow things to be working out the way that they are. I pray that right now you would win in their hearts. Be bigger than whatever they're worried about. Be more real than their pain. Raise their awareness that you are right there with them at this moment. Father, we recognize our worry is unhealthy, it's unproductive, but maybe up to now we haven't realized how it hurts your heart. That it's a sin because it's us failing to trust you. Father, we don't want that to be the case. We want to please you and honor you with our thoughts and our words and our actions. So give us the courage to surrender to you what we worry about and to make your agenda our top priority. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed this morning, listen, we can't experience God's peace if we aren't experiencing God. That's exactly why Jesus came. He came to make it possible for us to have a right relationship with our Heavenly Father. He lived a sinless life. He died on the cross, and then he did the ultimate miracle by defeating death so that anyone who puts their faith in him would be saved. We're rescued from our sins. We're rescued from our past. We're rescued from our guilt, and we're saved to a life with God. So we don't just divide our lives up and and give God the parts that we're worried about, but keep control of the rest. Instead, we want to come to him in complete surrender and say, God, I am yours. Maybe you're here this morning and you know that God's been waiting a while for you to take that step and fully surrender and get right with Him. I want to give you the opportunity to do that right now, right where you are. And you can take that step by just silently in your heart. Just follow me in a simple prayer to express that to Him. Just say, Jesus, I invite you to be the manager of my life. I admit I've done wrong. I need your forgiveness. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Make me a new person inside. Be the Lord of my life and give me the power to follow you. Amen. Listen, grab your connection card and as you're finishing filling that out, getting your name on that, writing your prayer request, whatever it might be, if you're taking that step of faith, if you're saying, Jesus, I want to trust you with my life today, do me a favor. On the back of that card, check the very top box in the red section there that says, I'm receiving Jesus as my Savior and Lord. I just want to know who you are so I can celebrate that this week and be praying for you. All right? So take a moment to do that. In just a moment, we are going to receive our offering. And as that basket comes by, drop your connection card in. What the offering time is, is just a time for people who have come prepared to financially give to support the mission and vision of the church. I know a number of you give automatically online. Some of you have given in the mail. But that's what makes it possible for us to do everything that we do. In fact, that's that's what makes our kids camp possible that's going on this weekend. Uh, They're having a big time. Uh, You can see some of the pictures there. And I've been hearing that kids are already taking steps uh, to trust Christ with their lives to say they're ready to follow him in baptism so thank you for giving and making weekends and experiences like this possible so that people can continue to take their next step toward Jesus we're going to go ahead and receive our offering now as we do go ahead and stand up and we are going to wrap it up with a song You unravel me with the melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance. 
from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no You split the sea so I 